In this video, we'll cover the standard level material related to gas exchange, particularly in animals. Now, it's important to understand here that gas exchange is a universal function for organisms, even aquatic ones. So even ones that live under the water are still bringing gases in and out. And because of that, they need to have specially adapted surfaces where gas exchange is going to take place. So I'm going to use these type 1 pneumocytes as an example. We'll talk a lot about these. Um, and a type 1 pneumocyte makes up part of the structure of lungs um, called alveoli. And so what we're going to notice is with type 1 pneumocytes and other gas exchange surfaces is that they have a lot of things in common. So first of all, they're very thin and that decreases the distances that gases may need to diffuse through. So they're very thin. They're also going to be permeable to gases. That means gases are able to cross those membranes and they are going to have a large surface surface area to volume ratio. So that's going to make them very efficient at getting things in and out. Now, gases are going to diffuse better when they are dissolved in solution. So we're also going to notice that these gas exchange surfaces are moist or have a moist covering on them. So these are going to be things that all gas exchange surfaces will have in common. Now, gas exchange is going to take place via diffusion, and diffusion is the passive movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And so it's really driven by this difference in concentration or the concentration gradient. So that process is going to be much more efficient or much faster when this concentration gradient is different, okay? So the larger the difference, the faster that's going to go. And so this is a great example of maybe how unicellular organisms would drive that diffusion process. This concentration of, let's say, like oxygen in here is going to remain low because those organisms are going to consume that oxygen. And so that's going to continue to create a concentration gradient, which will drive that diffusion process. Now, theme B is all about form and function. So when we think about this function of moving air or moving fresh water in and out of our ventilation systems, that's all to drive that diffusion process. Now, complex organisms, they're going to have a ventilation system, okay? So for you, that would be your lungs, and for fish, that would be their gills. Um, but again, both of those are accomplishing the same function. So let's take a look at these adaptations of mammalian lungs, the lungs of mammals, with the end goal of gas exchange. And we're going to go ahead and draw that. So I've started here with the mouth, and the mouth connects to a tube called the trachea. And that trachea is going to split into two tubes, okay, and each of these tubes is called a bronchus, okay? So bronchus singular, bronchi would be plural. Now, each of these tubes is going to split into a series of smaller tubes, and these are called bronchioles, okay? So I'll spell that here, bronchioles, and that's the name for these smaller tubes. These are going to end in these sac-like structures. We'll draw them in more detail in a few moments, okay? And these are called alveoli, okay? So those alveoli are the terminus branch of those bronchioles. All right, now these would all be contained within the lungs, so I'm gonna kind of draw that like this, trying not to uh, really mess up my labels here too much. You would obviously want to put your labels somewhere else. So maybe something like this to where our labels don't get crossed up with our drawing. And this is our lungs. They're all going to be driven by muscular movement. So our lungs aren't muscle tissue on their own. They rely on muscles surrounding them to move that fresh air in and out. And the main muscle that we'll include in our drawing here is the diaphragm, okay? So that muscle will contract to open up our rib cage there. Now, in this next drawing, what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on one of these alveoli and draw that in a little more detail. 
So what we're going to notice is that as air is entering through those bronchioles, it ends in this sac-like feature called an alveolus. Now this alveolus is made of these thin, flat cells called a type 1 pneumocyte. Pneumo referring to lungs, site meaning cell, and again, these are flat and gray areas for a diffusion. On the inside, we're going to find a different cell. It's going to be a tad bit different in shape. It's more cuboidal. It's because it's not for diffusion. This is something called a type 2 pneumocyte. And again, it is not a surface area for gas exchange. It uh, produces a material called surfactant, so more on that later. Now we're also going to notice that these alveoli are surrounded by a very dense network of capillaries, okay? So these capillary walls are, again, made of cells. They're going to be thin and flat, just like the type 1 pneumocytes, great for diffusion. And we're going to find these red blood cells that are traveling through these capillaries, picking up that oxygen, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. And again, all of that is driven by diffusion. So it's important to understand that these adaptations are all going to be geared towards that diffusion process, thin, flat, skinny, moist, high surface area to volume ratios. Now, going back to this type 2 pneumocyte, that's this cell right in here. Again, you can tell it's not for diffusion. That is there to produce a substance called surfactant. Now, surfactant's going to do a couple of things. It's going to kind of like line the inside of the alveolus here. This surfactant is going to reduce the surface tension, okay? So that's going to uh, prevent that alveolus from collapsing, and it's also going to provide moisture. Remember, those gases are going to diffuse uh, much more easily when they're dissolved in solution. Now, in order for those gases to diffuse, we need to maintain a high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli to drive that diffusion. Well, how do we do that? That's the process of ventilation. So for inhaling, okay, a couple of things are going to happen. So first, this diaphragm muscle is going to contract. And when it contracts, it's literally going to flatten out. That also contracts at the same time as your external intercostal muscles. So inter means between, costal means your rib bones, and we have external intercostals. And so what that's going to do is that's going to widen and pull apart and open up your rib cage. So when the diaphragm contracts, it's going to flatten things out. And that along with your external intercostals is really going to open up the rib cage. Your abdominal muscles and your interior intercostals are going to relax, and so that's going to allow that um, opening up of the rib cage to happen. When that occurs, that is going to increase the volume of the chest cavity and create kind of a vacuum, this negative pressure. So the pressure decreases, and that's what pulls air into the lungs. It's almost like a vacuum type force and the exact opposite will happen when we are exhaling. So in order to exhale those gases, we need to create a lot of pressure on the inside of our chest cavity. How do we do that? Well, we contract our abdominal muscles and our interior intercostals, and that's going to cause our chest cavity or our rib cage to kind of close in like this, okay? In order for that to occur, we're going to need the diaphragm and those external intercostals to relax. So our diaphragm goes back up into this like dome type shape here, okay? That's going to um, reduce the volume of our chest cavity, and when you reduce the volume, that will increase the pressure and force that air out of the lungs. In a moment, we'll talk about measurement of lung volumes, but first let's go through some vocabulary. We'll be calculating or measuring ventilation rate. Ventilation refers to the number of breaths or inhalations and exhalations per minute or per unit of time, whatever you choose. Just remember to be clear about that when you're expressing units of rate. Your tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled or exhaled in each breath. 
So if you breathe normally, you're gonna be moving air into and out of your lungs, but what you're probably not doing is breathing in the maximum amount of air that your lungs can hold. So when we take a normal breath, and I will abbreviate this as TD, tidal, or TV, tidal volume, okay? When we're taking a normal breath, there's still a certain amount of air that we can inhale, right? We haven't reached that maximum volume. And you can try that now. If I take a normal breath in, and then I force my lungs to fill all the way up. That doesn't feel super comfortable, right? What we're doing here is kind of exploring this idea of inspiratory reserve volume. So if you take a normal breath in, there's still a bit more room in your lungs to breathe more in, and this is called inspiratory reserve volume, or IRV. Same goes with breathing out. So when you breathe out normally, and then you pause, and then you keep breathing out until you feel like your lungs have totally emptied out. Again, what you're exploring here is the ERV or expiratory reserve volume. That's the amount of air that a person can inhale even after a normal breath. If I consider all of these together, your tidal volume, your inspiratory reserve volume, and your expiratory reserve volume, then I can add all of those together to get what we call the vital capacity. So that vital capacity is the total or maximum amount of air that the lungs can hold. So this is like the total, how much can I fit in these lungs? And that includes your normal breaths, your tidal volume, plus what you can still inhale, plus what you can still exhale after those normal breaths. Now, when it comes to measuring these lung volumes, there's a couple of different things that you can do. You may have access to what's called a spirometer, and a spirometer is gonna be like a digital device, and it'll come connected to like a hose type thing that you will put into your mouth and it looks like this and you'll wear a nose clip and that volume of air that you're breathing in and out will be measured by a digital device, okay? And so you'll see things like this pop up on your screen. So you'll have time at one point in the bottom and you'll have liters of air up here on the side of your screen and it will tell you um, how much air you're breathing in and you're breathing out over the course of a certain period of time. Alternatively, if you don't have a spirometer, you could set up something called a bell jar, and that bell jar is going to be filled with water, so it's important that you only breathe out and not breathe in. But as that air is forced through this tube, what that's going to do is that's going to push air bubbles up into this bell jar, okay? And we're going to notice that this water level starts to go down, down, down. So you can actually measure the volume of air that is breathed out each time. So either one of these are um, great to look into and they also make really interesting IAs if you're um, looking for an idea.